from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Present the Librarian of Congress, James H. Billington. Thank you very much, and welcome to this gala crowd for the National Book Festival. You know, with this wonderful array of writers we have, we're reminded as we go through the copyright deposit and the other great collections at the Library of Congress, how rich and varied the creative life of America is. The, the boundaries that once existed between what's classical and what's popular have been largely broken down. Certainly in the music field where the arrangers in America are sometimes as important as both the composers and the performers. Today, we're gonna to open the festivities by recognizing in a special way someone who is in many respects an American original as well as a great and much beloved writer. We are opening the festivities by presenting for the first time ever and with this gala crowd as witness, the first ever National Book Festival Creative Achievement Award to an outstanding and prolific writer who will be reading to us later today, John Grisham, for your extraordinary contribution. to American letters, to a vast readership, to a wonderful welcoming crowd here today, and also to important charitable causes, I am happy to present you with this new award. Your literary success is legendary, but you've also done other important things for the nation and its people. Through your Rebuild the Coast Fund, <clears throat> you raised nearly nine million dollars for Gulf Coast relief in the wake of Hurricane <laughs> Katrina. <laughs> you supported the use of DNA evidence to exonerate the wrongly convicted and you endowed scholarships and writing programs at the University of Mississippi. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me. He'll be followed by the great critic Jonathan Yardley in dialogue, but let's join me now, please, in recognizing John Grisham as the recipient of the new National Book <laughs> Festivities <laughs> Theater. Mm -hmm. Thank you all, uh, y'all. Uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Dr. Billington, for those kind remarks, and thank you for this award. Uh, I did not win the Heisman. Uh, <laughs> I've given up on the Nobel and probably the Pulitzer. Uh, that's fine. Um, this is far more important and will be far more cherished. When you write popular fiction, you don't get a lot of awards. <laughs> And that's fine, that's part of the territory, I understand that. We are uh, awarded and rewarded in other ways. What I try to do is, what I aspire to do is to write, hopefully, a high quality of popular fiction that appeals to many people. And so far in this career, uh, that has been successful, and that is award and reward enough for me. Uh, thank all of you folks for coming. I'm, I'm touched by the crowd. And I will say this, after 23 books, number 23 comes out in November, and I think Jonathan Yardley and I might discuss that book here in a few moments. He's already read it. Um, the books are still a lot of fun to write. The words and ideas are still coming quickly. I've never had one day of writer's block. I have just the opposite problem. The, the challenge I face every year is which book to write next. It still feels new, it still feels fresh and fun, 
And because of you and your loyalty, uh, the books are paying off, and I still plan to write a lot of books. So thank you all, and thank you, Dr. Billington. Post? Are we not on? Hi, I'm Jonathan Yardley, book critic of the Washington Post. Thank you. Thanks, that's a nice way to begin the day, and, a, and a, to a totally unexpected one. I have a little bit of business to do. Uh, there's a disclaimer. On behalf of the Library of Congress, welcome to the 2009 National Book Festival. We hope you are having a wonderful day celebrating the joy of reading here on the National Mall. This is not my prose. <laughs> but before we begin, I want to inform you that the Pavilion's presentations are being filmed for the Library of Congress's website and for their archives. Please be mindful of this as you enjoy the presentation. In addition, please do not sit on the camera risers that are located in the back of the Pavilion. I might say yesterday I discovered these um, webcasts on the uh, book festival site, and they're really amazing. They go all the way back to 2001. I was able to see my wife, Marie Arana, being interviewed not eight years ago. It was quite a kick. Uh, so now, for the first 40, 45 minutes, I'm going to have a conversation with John Grissom, and then we're going to turn it over to you all. And at that time, I believe that people will be asked to come up to the microphones and line up. Please, please don't start lining up until uh, the uh, question period begins. I think we'll sit down. I hope you all can see us through this. On? Testing. Okay. Can, you, can you hear us? No. A little more volume, please. We got a big crowd, biggest I've ever seen at the National Book Festival. And it'd be even bigger if we had better weather. Um, John, you were born in Arkansas, but spent much of your early life in small town Mississippi, an environment you drew on for your first novel, A Time to Kill, for your novel about high school football, Bleachers and now for a collection of short stories coming out next month, Ford County. I'm privileged to have been one of its very earliest readers. I won't be reviewing it, but I wish I could because it's absolutely wonderful. I get the impression you had a pretty happy childhood and youth, but the 1950s and 1960s were a difficult time for the South generally and your part of the South specifically. Please tell us a bit about your boyhood and about how you came to have such strong feelings about racial and social and economic injustice. Wow. Uh, how long do we have? Uh, is that your only question, John? Yeah. I got two and a half pages. <laughs> it was uh, a, a pretty typical childhood. For those of you who have read uh, A Painted House, and I assume all of you have, then I will not, I will not ask for a show of hands. I'm not, I made that mistake one time, and I vowed to never do it again. Nobody raised their hand. Uh, the book was very, uh, Painted House was very autobiographical. I was that little boy for the first seven years of my life on a cotton farm in Arkansas, and times were pretty tough, and my parents were lucky, and we got out of that. And so we moved uh, to various small towns in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, and because we moved every year, my father worked for one company, and we, they moved us every summer, a construction company. I was always a new kid in town, and I think that had a lot to do with uh, shaping uh, my personality. One of the first things we did in every, the first thing we did in every small town, and these are towns like uh, Crenshaw, Mississippi, uh, Parkin, Arkansas, Delhi, Louisiana, Ripley, Mississippi, all over the South. The first thing we did was join the local Baptist church. Um, the second thing we did was my mother took us to the library. She didn't believe in much in television. And we would gauge the quality of life in uh, each new town by two things. First of all, how many library books they allowed us to check out at one time. <laughs> and every town was different. It was always a huge question with me and my brothers and sisters was, how many books can you get? And we'd take them all home and read them and swap them around. That's, I grew up in you know, just a house full of books. 
And the second factor was the quality of the Little League baseball field. We'd, we'd find the Little League baseball park and my brother, and we could tell right then what kind of town we'd moved to. Uh, and it was a very happy childhood. I never thought about writing. Uh, I thought I, I was a big reader because of my mother and because of uh, some great high school English teachers later on. Back then in the mid-60s, uh, the Deep South it was very, very segregated. I recall the separate entrances for, for, for whites and coloreds, as it was called. Do you remember the, the murders in Neshoba? No, that was 1964. I was uh, 1965, I was nine years old. We were living in Arkansas. Okay. Uh, I remember uh, some of the racial incidents. I, I, I was sitting in a movie th a theater in Ripley, Mississippi when I was 11 years old when the uh, black folks first tried to sit down with the white folks. They were always in the balcony. And it was a big deal. I mean, it was a, they had to call the police and all that. Uh, there were a lot of incidents like that uh, growing up. Uh, but it was a, a very segregated world. The schools were segregated until I was 15. And we always assumed it would stay segregated. You know, we were determined uh, that culture back then, we, we always thought we would be safe. We wouldn't go to school with blacks, wouldn't live with blacks, we, you know, we would always be separate. And looking back now, it's, uh, it's very hard to, um, to understand those feelings. It's very hard to, I don't fault my parents, my families for raising us in that type of a, uh, a very biased world, uh, but that's just the way it was. Well, and, 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 and a lot of whites my age and my generation um, still struggle with the, way, with the way we thought and the way we were raised back then. My, my oldest, the older of my two sons was based in New Orleans for several years as a reporter for the Atlanta Constitution and covered Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and East Texas. And he felt very strongly that of the states of the Deep South, Mississippi had, had sorry, he felt that of the states of the Deep South, Mississippi had the best chance to achieve some kind of racial concord, that there was less violence and bitterness than there was in Alabama, and that there was, uh, that, that people seemed to be a little, e little easier with each other despite all the trouble. How would you respond to that? I'm not sure I agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Mississippi was, if you look at the, at the James Meredith incident in 1962, October, when he tried to enroll at Ole Miss, that was basically the, la the last battle of the Civil right. War. Right. And it was a, the last stand and time out. We got a problem here. Oh. Just stick it in your mouth. You know? <laughs> Okay. You go ahead and clip it on your glasses. Would that work right. up there? <laughs> but uh, I, 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 think, I think Mississippi was the last stand, the last. I think it was worse there. Really? Than, and a lot of people, um, when, when Meredith tried to enroll at Ole Miss, there were a lot of people from other states who came in to take part in that little uh, right. party. Right. Um, and that's what made it so bad. But it was, uh, listen, um, Brown versus Board was 1954. It was a year before I was born. We did not integrate uh, until the fall of 1970, 16 years later, and it's when the Supreme Court, Hugo Black, who was from Alabama, finally wrote that famous line. He said, it's been 16 years. Enough is enough. You're going to integrate tomorrow. And that's what it took. It didn't take almost federal marshals, but you know the massive resistance we were able to put up for 16 years. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think Mississippi was the last stand. What, at, at what point in your life did you arrive at the, the, the convictions that are very passionately expressed in, in, in your writing about the broad question of injustice? Well, it was, uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's very simple. Had I not become a lawyer, um, I'm not sure I would have had such a radical change in the way I view most of the world. Uh, when you represent people who are accused of crimes, people who have been injured, people who have no voice, people who can't pay you, and you're committed to your clients, and you're their last stand. I mean, if, if, you, if you can't help them, they can't be helped. And you realize how many people out there, half the people in this country today do not have access to civil justice. Every criminal defendant by the Constitution has a right to a lawyer. That's not true in civil cases. Let, uh, half of our people can afford a lawyer, the other half can't get representation. 
I, I represent a lot of people who couldn't pay. Uh, that's why I started writing books, because I couldn't. <laughs> my specialty was pro bono law. I mean, most of my, <laughs> my cases didn't start off pro bono. They just, I never got paid. I worked for free. But I mean, that, that uh, changed me. I was always fighting for the, the you know, I was a street lawyer. I was the people who were on the streets, the little people. I was, I was always fighting big insurance companies and banks and big manufacturers and, you know, it just, I s switched overnight. And I, I, w I would never have written the first book if I hadn't been a lawyer. Uh, I, I think that forces me to skip ahead in questions. Uh, in The Street Lawyer, as in many of your other books, including your most recent, The Associate, the central character is an honest, rather idealistic young lawyer who finds his convictions challenged by cynicism greed and corruption in the big, high-powered law firm for which he works. I suspect that in spirit, if not in specific details, these characters are autobiographical. I know you've never worked in one of these firms yourself, but you obviously have very strong feelings about them, indeed about big institutions generally, law firms, banks, insurance companies, etc. Since we're right now only a couple of miles from K Street, I'm, I'm sure this audience would love to hear you on that subject and perhaps about this year's bailouts as well. How'd you tie bailouts into big law firms? <laughs> insurance I mean, We companies. haven't bailed out big law firms yet, have we? It's probably, probably coming us, next week, Dave. Give us time. A lot of them are in trouble, yeah. Well, again, I was never uh, invited to become a member of a big law firm. Uh, I was not, uh, again, for those of you who've read The Firm, and I assume all of you have, but I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. <laughs> Uh, I was, thank you, I, I was not heavily recruited out of law school. Um, I, there were no job offers, and I really didn't want any. I wanted to go back to my hometown and hang out in my shingle and, and run for political office and, and be a, a, the lawyer who represented, you know, people. Um, but I've always been fascinated. I had a lot of friends who went to work for big law firms, and, and I've always been fascinated with the way they operate, uh, the, the low level of fulfillment and happiness in big law firms. And the truth is, most lawyers are honest, hardworking people who don't make a lot of money. You don't want to read about those people. <laughs> you want to read about the big corrupt law firm with power and all. I mean, you want to read about the lawyer who steals the money and fakes his death and, and watches his own funeral and winds up in prison. That's a whole lot more fun than reading about some poor guy down the street drafting wills and deeds. I mean, you know. You got to write. You, you guys don't want to read. You don't want to read that stuff, do you? Okay. So, <laughs> so that I mean, that's I'm fascinated with big law firms, but only as a target for my fiction. Uh, they're not all bad, and and I, you know I get bashed a lot for bashing lawyers, but it, I don't I don't think that's necessarily true. In almost every one of my books, there's going to be a good lawyer. Mm -hmm. There's right. going to be a good, honest, right. uh, ethical lawyer who's struggling with um, where he or she is in life. Mm -hmm. um. You have mentioned uh, on a number of occasions that when you were a teenager, you, were, you found your way to the work of John Steinbeck and read yourself right through it all and were deeply affected by it. Were there any other writers in your early or in your youth whose the reading of whom you, has stuck with you? Well, mo even more so than uh, John Steinbeck would be Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. uh, I read uh, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. I loved Tom Sawyer. I didn't really understand Huck Finn until later. How did, how did Huck Finn evolve as you reread it over the years? You know what? Somebody, and I'll tell you exactly. I was, I was in college, and uh, I read Hemingway's famous quote, right. you know, all great American novels start with Huck Finn. And I remember reading Huck Finn when I was a kid, and I thought, well, I didn't get that much out of it. So I, I kind of studied the book and realized there was a lot more to it. Than, uh, but Mark Twain first, and I mean, Life on the Mississippi. Uh, roughing it. Those books I, I read when I was 14, 15 years old and, and still go back to them now because I, th I love Mark Twain. I, I, I think he's the funniest person who ever lived. Right. Uh, but when I was in high school, I told this story yesterday, there's a, I'm sure there's a state law in Mississippi that you have to read Faulkner when you're in school. And, <laughs> or, or at least the law says the high school teachers have to teach Faulkner in school. And so every high school teacher, you know, starts with the sound and the fury. And for 15-year-old kids, you got you have no clue what's going on. And and that's that's how I started uh, reading serious literature. I had a sympathetic high school teacher who also let us read John Steinbeck. So we had Steinbeck on one hand, who you could read and understand, 
and Faulkner you're carrying around trying to avoid uh, because you had no idea what the guy was saying. And that's when I really fell in love with Steinbeck. I, I love the, the clarity of his writing and the, and the simple but powerful prose and the way he could tell a story. Here's the way I pose that question. I know from some things you've written, including a story in Ford County called Funny Boy, that you read and admired Faulkner. For any Mississippian who wants to write, or for that matter, any Southerner, he's a formidable presence. Flannery O'Connor called him the Dixie Limited. Um, obviously, he hasn't, he hasn't influenced your own very lean prose style, but are there other ways in which he's touched your work? Well, you know, before we moved to Charlottesville, Virginia, 15 years ago, our home is Oxford, Mississippi. Renee and I both went to school there. We got married in Oxford uh, a few years back, and uh, then we moved there in 1990 and with plans to stay there forever. Um, the only, I think the only way Faulkner really influenced me was, his, and it, it was, it was not, it's not a small influence, was his commitment to his craft and his determination to survive as a writer against uh, un, uh, unbelievable odds. I mean, at one time he was supporting three or four families. When he won the Nobel Prize in 1950, all of his books were out of print. And he was in Hollywood cranking out cheap screenplays to, to buy groceries. And it was that commitment to, to his craft and to his profession that uh, inspires every writer, I think, or should inspire every writer. Mm -hmm. I can't let Mississippi pass without mentioning another of the state's great writers. Has Eudora Welty played any part in your reading and writing? Well, her short stories, again, uh, we, we read those when I was a student. Uh, there's a, you know, for a small, poor southern state, there's a great deal of pride in, in the number of great writers that have come from that state. And, right. and the question is always, how? Why? Why so many writers from down there? And Willie Morris said it was something in the water. Uh, yeah, and, and Walker Percy said it was because we lost the war. Yeah, there, there's, there's something in Willie's water. There's always something in right, Willie's I water. Know. I think I think Walker Percy is right. When, when you have a, when you have a any any locale where you have great suffering, right. and and certainly there's been so much of it down there, it naturally produces great stories, right. and and someone has to tell those stories. Right. And Mrs. Wealthy was you know the master of the short story, yep. and, and I grew up with a lot of her short stories. In interviews, you tend to characterize yourself as a quote suspense writer and to shrug off as, quote, preaching the themes that marked your work. I guess this is appealingly modest, but I don't think it's true. Your best novels rise well above the limitations of genre, and your passionate feelings about injustice in any form are obviously deeply serious. Surely you don't re really think of yourself as just an entertainer. I write, I try to write two types of legal thrillers. First and foremost, they're entertaining because when I write a book, I want you hooked on the first page or shortly thereafter. I want the pages to fly by. I want you to devour the book. I want you to stay up late at night, skip work, skip lunch. <laughs> I want you to devour that book in 48 hours and, and, and want some more, okay? Yep. And I've gotten so lazy, the books are not going to get thicker. I promise you that. They're getting thinner. Um, it's first and foremost entertaining, and, and that's what I enjoy doing. Occasionally, I, I'll take an issue, whether, whether it might be homelessness here in D.C., or whether it might be fraudulent judicial elections in the appeal, or whether it might be uh, the death penalty in the chamber or the innocent man, uh, wrongful convictions in the innocent man, uh, some issue that just has gotten me fired up right. that year, you know, I'm mad about something. <coughs> If I can take that issue and weave it through a legal thriller and entertain you, but also get you to think about something maybe you haven't thought about. And these are issues I haven't thought about. I had never thought about wrongful convictions and, and exonerations until four years ago. And I was a lawyer for 10 years. I never, I never had a client I thought was wrongfully convicted. And I discovered this case of this man who was my age and was almost executed. He was completely innocent. And it's thrown me into the world of wrongful convictions, and I've become convinced now that there are thousands of innocent people in prison. And for someone who believes in our system, that keeps me up at night. And I'm still you know, bothered by it. I'm not finished with that issue. But it's, it was something new for me. So if it's something new, when you read that book, if you were exposed to it for the first time, to me that makes the book better. And then there are times when, when, my, when 
my wife Renee says, look, stop preaching. Just get off the soapbox, okay? You gotta <laughs> just tell a story. And so, uh, she, and she's right. You can't, in popular fiction, you can't, you can't preach too much. You can get by with a little bit of it. But you, you can't wear your attitudes on your sleeve the whole time because you may offend a lot of readers. In, in your forthcoming story collection, Ford County, there's a story called Michael's Room, which is quite powerful and is clearly um, motivated by a strong conviction. It's about a uh, fast, fast-talking, high-powered, small-town lawyer who manages to uh, get a, a doctor and his insurance company off the hook for a clear case of malpractice that leaves a, a small, very small boy a, a, a vegetable for life. And um, his father comes after the lawyer many years after the fact in a, a very surprising and extremely, extremely dramatic encounter. Uh, when was that story written, and was there a specific event that triggered it? Well, one of the dangers of practicing law in a small town is sometimes you bump into people you've sued. And, uh, <laughs> or people you have defeated in court. Uh, when I was a real young lawyer, I was the assistant city judge, if you can believe that. Here, at 30 years old with a black robe on, didn't know anything, but I was city court. Most of it was traffic stuff and drunks and shoplifters. And I'd sent a guy to jail uh, for 30 days because he needed to go to jail for 30 days. Mm -hmm. And about 30 days later, I was in the Kroger store and walked around the frozen food section, and there he was. And he looked a whole lot bigger. Uh, than... <laughs> and there was a moment there when I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And uh, he certainly recognized me, and I certainly recognized him, and um, no nothing happened, uh, thank God. But I, I, that's one of the dangers of practicing law in a small town. And, Again, I took that um, episode and often wondered, you know, why you don't see more of this. And I've had lawyer friends who had the same type of encounters. Um, but I've often wondered about some of these lawyers who will do anything to win a case and a courtroom victory. And, a, and the point of the story is a courtroom victory is not always justice. Right. And the lawyer wins a case that he should have lost. And the point of the story is to show seven, eight years later the long-term effects of not adequately compensating someone who deserved it. Right. And the, the story was written, there, there's seven stories in this collection. Uh, most of them were written in the past several years. A couple go back almost 20 years. Uh, one was written, you know, this summer. Uh, Are, were, they, were they stabs at, at a novel or were they, were they just things that you wanted to get on paper? I think most of them started off with the idea of a novel. Mm -hmm. There's always, um, several ideas floating around for the next novel. And, I mean, you know, I, I study lawyers, I watch, I don't study, I watch lawyers, lawsuits, trials, litigation, always with an eye for what might become a, a book or, or an issue. And the good ideas stick mentally for a long time, and I try to envision the beginning and the end, which are usually pretty easy. The hard part is trying to sustain the narrative tension for 300 pages. Right. That's the difficult part of writing a a novel. When, when I have a great idea, or I think it's a great idea, I, I'll then move on to the next step of actually outlining it. I put word, words on paper. Most of these stories, uh, it's at one point in the past few years, I thought might be a novel. Uh, but I, they, I just couldn't flesh them out mm -hmm, enough. Mm -hmm. and, and as short stories, they're pretty long. Yes, they are. One, I think the shortest one is 35 pages long, and the longest one is maybe 50. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wanted to call them long stories, uh, <laughs> which I thought was a great idea. I'd never seen a book called Long Stories before. And uh, I was serious about it. I thought, you know, let's do something different, but no, they wouldn't, let, they wouldn't have it in New York. Right, so, well, they, so they're, so they're old-fashioned short stories. Given, the bu given book publishing history, I would think long st stories would sell better than short Don't stories. Don't you? It's a great idea. Maybe um, I'll do it next time. You, you've often talked about your conscious decision to write a very, quote, commercial novel after A Time to Kill was a commercial failure. But come on, writing a book as skillful as The Firm isn't something you just roll out of bed and do. Uh, what models did you use for it? How did you go about making this book? You had, you had no experience at... at time, time to Kill was the first thing I ever wrote. It was, uh, becoming a writer was not a childhood dream. It's not something I thought about in college. It, it happened later in life. I was. 30 years old, it was 1984, 1985, 
when I, when I was inspired with this courtroom drama that eventually became A Time to Kill. A Time to Kill was published 20 years ago, and I mean, they printed 5,000 hardback copies, and it didn't, I mean, it didn't sell. Right. The, I mean, the book was never, it never went to a second printing. It never went to paperback. It never went to foreign sales, movies, all the stuff I was dreaming of. And after writing that book for three years, I said, okay, you know, this little hobby is going nowhere. Uh, <laughs> I was very busy as a lawyer. I mean, I wasn't making any money, but I was busy. Uh, I had been elected to the state legislature. Uh, Renee was having babies. I mean, life was pretty busy. Uh, and I didn't have time to keep playing around with fiction. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I thought, OK, this book didn't sell. I'm going to do it one more time. I'm going to write one more book. And I'm going to write something as blatantly commercial as I can <laughs> without, without a lot of gratuitous sex and violence, which I can't write anyway. Uh, I was asked one time on, uh, by an interview on, on camera, uh, Renee and I were being interviewed, and somebody, the person said, why, doesn't, uh, why don't you write about sex? And Renee just blurted out, she said, well, he knows very little about sex. <laughs> uh, well, you know, thank you, dear, for, for that. It's on national television. Uh, I wrote a sex scene one time. Renee reads every, cha she reads the books chapter by chapter, and occasionally, you know, she's bored, she's occupied, she does, after 23 books, sometimes she just doesn't want to do it. And uh, I have to kind of, you know, hog tire and make her re read, the, read the next chapters. And a few times I've like, stuck stuff in there, you know, to see if I could get by with it. And um, I wrote a sex scene one time, and no kidding, I was, I'm always sort of nearby when I plant these things. I heard her laughing. And, uh, <laughs> so I can't write sex. I'm not going to write sex. Uh, so anyway, I was going to write a book without the sex, without the violence, but also, you know, suspenseful, a page turner, a, a, a clever plot. You know, that, that's just. But how did you know? How did you know how to do that? That's hard. Uh, you know, John. I don't know. Um, I was reading a lot of suspense. I was reading a lot of Ken Follett, mm -hmm. Jeffrey Archer. Robert Ludlum, uh, you know, some of the great masters of suspense. And I, I guess through that process, I taught myself, I mean, I never took notes or anything, but um, there was a point in time when I first started writing where I read everything on the New York Times bestseller list. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was very inspirational because most of it was so bad. Right. And, uh, <laughs> And no, no I'm, I'm serious. That I would read a great book, and I would say, seriously, I, I'll never be that good. Mm -hmm. But there's still, and I, then I'd read a, another book, and I'd say, this is not good at all. Right. I can beat this. Right. And it's sort of, the bad book sort of inspired me. But I was reading a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, suspense, a lot of page turners, and somehow in that process. So you process, were absorbing it by osmosis. I guess I absorbed it. By, I never, I can't say I studied it. Right. I, I read what I enjoyed reading, and the firm just, you know, it, the book worked. Uh, there was very little editing in the book. And when it went to New York, um, it, was not, it was not that well received when my agent started showing it around you know, the fall of 1989. Um, no, I mean, there was no stampede to buy the firm. Um, got a lucky break and sold the film rights before we sold the book rights, and, and that's what made it work. Um, what, what about the craft of writing? Do you, uh, is this something that has just come naturally to you? Do you, do you take much editing? I take a lot of, I insist on being edited. And it starts, um, it starts at home mm -hmm. with Renee, with, who over the years has grown increasingly uh, heavy handed with the red pen. Mm -hmm. um, we've had huge fights over the fiction. Um, our kids, as they grew up, they'd hear us yelling, and they'd come running downstairs and realize it was just a fight over the of a book. You know, not a real, a real fight. We were just fighting over a book. Um, once I clear that, um, my agent in New York was my editor for a number of years. We've been together for 20 years, and he gives it a thorough edit. Then my publisher, Steve Rubin, between those three people, mm -hmm. Renee and David Rub uh, Gurdon, Steve Rubin, and we've always had the understanding that w among those three people, anybody can say anything. Right. You can say anything, right. and I'll listen. And a lot of big authors, once they reach a point, they get tired, lazy, whatever. They turn in a thousand-page manuscript and say, don't touch it. Right. And you can sure tell it. Oh, boy. You yeah. can sure tell it. 
but I think the editing is um, something I'm very serious about. Not that the story changes, but a lot of suggestions, a lot of line editing, and it makes the book better. Did, did you at any point study writing? <coughs> I studied accounting. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, no, I did not study writing, uh, and I, I'm not sure how well you can teach it. Right. Um, but I just, I didn't, I, I studied accounting, and I studied law, and uh, everything else kind of fell into place. Mm -hmm. A question that interests me, and I'm sure interests your readers, um, what about research? In your acknowledgments at the end of playing for pizza, mm -hmm. you say you learned about American football in Italy while researching another novel, which I assume was The Broker. Yet in The Broker, you say very amusingly, quote, it's all fiction, folks. I know very little about spies, electronic surveillance, satellite phones, smartphones, bugs, wires, mics, and the people who use them. If something in this novel approaches accuracy, it's probably a mistake. <laughs> so how much research do you really do? do? Do you do it all yourself, or do you hire some of it out? Well, I really went to Italy. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I really had all that food and all that wine. Right. Um, I saw all those places. So some of the research I'm very serious about. Right. Uh, and that's the great thing about writing. You go anywhere to do research, and, and it's all tax deductible. Right. So it's, it's, it's my, my job. Uh, the, the other research is I'm frustrated when I have to stop the creative process and go look up a fact. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I won't do that. I'll just change something. You know, a street here in Washington or a hotel or move something around. Mark Twain said he once moved an entire state and nobody knew it. I mean, you can, <laughs> you can do that with fiction. Um, but no, when we get down to the really uh, nitty gritty, I'll have a research assistant um, who does the bulk of the work, the bulk of the research. Is this someone who actually works full time for you? No, I've used a, a few UVA law students over the years. We're in Charlottesville and I'll hire a law student. Uh, to do the really uh, intense work. Uh, my son's doing some research for me now. And frankly, with Google now, it's yeah, really yeah. easy to check stuff. And if, if, my, if my story gets much more complicated than Wikipedia, I'm in trouble, okay? <laughs> in and I say that because the, 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 the mistake a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of lawyers are really good storytellers, and they're pretty good writers, right. but their books often don't work because they get bogged down too much. They want to show you how much right. they know. Right. They want to impress you with their knowledge of the law and how good they are. And that's also true with a lot of other uh, pretty good writers, pretty good storytellers. They can just bog you down with all the research and stuff you don't really, you know, a mutilated corpse only needs so much description. Right. Uh, um, but some people go on for pages. Um, so I keep mine light. In, in, in uh, Ford County, there's a terrific story called Casino in which a, a, a little wimpy little man gets revenge on his errant ex-wife by um, uh, folding down a casino at the game of blackjack. I don't play blackjack. I don't gamble. Um, but it seemed to me that you had a surpassing mastery of the ins and outs of blackjack. <laughs> well, I'm not a gambler. Uh, but usually once a year, I go to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And I take my father-in-law, who loves to play poker, and a couple of buddies, and we like to watch college football, place our bets. And I, I do enjoy playing blackjack, mm -hmm. but I'm not serious about it. Uh, when you lose some you know, hard-earned hard money real fast, it kind of yeah. takes away the romance of the, but, of the sport. But, but, the, but the, the way this guy was playing, um, somebody who knew the game of blackjack would yeah. know that he, was, that he was really winning. Yeah, I mean, I did some research. I, I did some pretty good research on blackjack and how and really the different rules of the casino. And uh, the, I wrote that story because it's amazing in the rural south and in many parts of the country today to see casinos. Mm -hmm, right. I mean, these, these, are, these are areas that are adamantly against gambling and alcohol and sin and everything. Is, okay? Isn't there one right on the banks of the Mississippi and Vicksburg? Oh, to, well, they're all over Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was in the Mississippi legislature the night we passed a bill by one vote after midnight um, that, that approved casino gambling, mm -hmm. and nobody knew it. Mm -hmm. we, we did not know what we had just done. The bill was that thick, nobody read it. Uh, they popped it on the desk, and, and we, it passed by one vote, passed the uh, Senate by one vote. It was signed by the governor before anybody knew what we had done. And now you've got 25 casinos right. all over Mississippi, big casinos on the Gulf Coast and 
and on the river. Uh, it was, it was, it was uh, sold as riverboat gambling. And now you have these Vegas style casinos in um, you know, the, the, the poorest state in the nation. You, speaking of casinos, as you all probably know, many of the Mississippi casinos are on the Gulf Coast and were wiped out during Katrina. Were you in Oxford during the hurricane? No, we were, uh, we were in, in Charlottesville uh, watching. You, you came down, to, to down south, didn't you? You wrote some stuff about it. You yeah, we were down there right after it happened because we had friends on the coast. Right. And we had friends who left the coast and, were, um, and, and stayed at our house in Oxford. Mm -hmm. Our house in Oxford is you know, 250 miles uh, inland, right. so it was safe. Uh, but it was, we had a lot of people we knew that were wiped out mm -hmm. and friends we were worried about, friends we, we didn't talk to for several days. And Renee and I took off as soon as we could and went down there and then got, saw how bad it was and how uh, just unbelievable. So we got serious about raising some money and helping out. Right. Um, Washington, D.C. is the setting for much of the broker. Other novels in which this city figures are The Pelican Brief and The Street Lawyer, which I think is one of your best books. Here you confront injustice as it appears in the lives of Washington's homeless. How did you decide to write this novel, and how did you learn about the specific details of the lives of the homeless? The book happened, the book started here in D.C. Uh, one night when I was here doing an event, I had an altercation with a homeless person just behind the Hay Adams Hotel, you know, across from the White House. And um, I had never really, I'd seen homeless people before in, you know, the big cities. But growing up in small towns, we didn't have homeless people. We never saw, you know, people sleeping on benches or begging for money. I don't know where they were. They did, you know, they weren't called homeless. I'm sure they were around. And the altercation, you know, turned out to nothing really happened, but I couldn't forget the guy. I couldn't forget his face, his, his desperation. And I began thinking about this guy, and I thought, well, you know, where, where is he going to be tonight, tomorrow night, next week, next year? How did he get here? You know, is, is he that much different from me? And I, I became captivated, with, uh, just really consumed with this idea of homelessness. Started to study the issue, and I started coming to D.C. Well, again, we live just a couple hours away. And I went to the homeless shelters and the soup kitchens and... And I talked to a lot of lawyers who represent homeless people pro bono. I talked to the social workers, and this novel took shape, took place of this young lawyer who has an altercation with a homeless person that turns violent, and it changes his life. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the book was uh, created and was all set right here. And, and I think it's one of, of all the books I've written about issues, the, the Street Lawyer is the one book that I think had the most impact. I, I don't, I don't pretend that these books are going to change a lot of opinions or policy, but I know that the street lawyer affected a lot of people. Um, it must be a little bit difficult for you at this stage in your career to, to do on-site research. You're a, you're a well-known man. Your name is well-known. Does that come up as a problem? No. It doesn't? I'm a famous writer in a country where few people well, that's, read. that's so. true. <laughs> Well, yes, to, yes. I can walk down the street here in D.C., and chances are nobody's going to say a word. If I put a baseball cap on, I'm home free. Um, the, uh, what I typically do when I was in D.C., I would uh, I'd get, a, um, get a car and a driver, get somebody who knows the town, and spend the day with them. And they can, you know, take you anywhere you want to go. You take some, you know, you can do a lot of research pretty fast just by going somewhere and, you know, looking at a couple of crack houses and things. That's about all you need to see. Uh, homeless shelters and things like that. But I mean, the, the research is, when I'm, on, when I'm on site doing it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the book work I don't really like. You, you, you mentioned yesterday that when you learned about the, the actual case of miscarried ju justice in Oklahoma four or five years ago, that you got in touch with the victim, victim's two sisters and that you had some trouble convincing them who you were. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, I saw this obituary for the guy who I wrote about, The Innocent Man, Ron Williamson, and I was totally taken with the story. And he left, uh, he had just died, he was 51 years old. He came within five days of being executed in 1994 for a murder he did not commit, and it's just a great story. And I knew I was gonna write it the moment I saw the story, saw the obituary. He left two sisters, one in Dallas and one in Tulsa, and I, I called them, just impulsively, I called them right then. And it took a while, they thought it was a joke. Uh, they, you know, they thought it was 
they, they both were big readers and um, had enjoyed my books. And it took a while to convince them that I was who else. So that, because over the years, they've had a lot of uh, people call them and want to do TV shows and stuff about their brother's story. It took a while to, to convince them, but uh, they jumped on board pretty quick. And I went to Oklahoma to see them and to see all these uh, unforgettable people who the story was there. I mean, I didn't create this story. I couldn't create something this good. Uh, the challenge with The Innocent Man was simply piecing it all together in, in a way that I could tell the story like a legal thriller. All right. yeah. Do you have any reason to believe that that book has had any effect on the uh, whole question of D DNA and, and uh, wrongful conviction? Well, yeah, I mean, it has, it has convinced some people I know based on the letters I get uh, from people who can't believe the story, I get a lot of letters from people uh, from around the world who don't believe the story's true. They just think I made it up. Um, it has, working through the various innocence projects around the country, and I do a lot of that work now, I know the book has quite a following. You know, when I, when I publish a book, I know it's going to be read. I, I know that X number are going to be sold, and those are probably going to be read and hardback and paperback and in, in English. And then you have the rest of the world, 50 something languages now. Um, so it's, I mean, there's, obviously there's a big market for it. And people are gonna, a story like that, when, it, when they know it's nonfiction and this is a real issue, it's, it's gotta have some impact. I think our time's up. Yeah. He, he was flashing us while we were. Okay, um, finally. I didn't mean to cut you off. All yeah, right. You're a book critic, I don't wanna get you too mad at me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you're, you're, you're off my review list. I, I'm up here with you now. I can't review you anymore. Um, you've done extraordinarily well in a writing career that's only 20 years old. Your wealth, and wealth is the word for it, has enabled you to live a good life in Mississippi, Charlottesville, and now Chapel Hill, and to contribute to causes and institutions you care about, including that excellent literary and cultural magazine, The Oxford American. How's your life changed? Are there intense pressures on your time? you have to spend a lot of time saying no in order to do your writing and live a reasonably normal life? We, are, we Renee and I, have always been determined to live a normal life. Um, we don't, you know, we don't have elaborate security. We, we, just, we don't believe in that kind of stuff. When the, when the book started selling, it was a radical change that came, it wasn't overnight, but it happened awfully fast with The Firm and The Pelican Brief and The, the, and the Movies. The movies of The Firm, Pelican Brief, and Klein all came out, those three came out within a 12 month span. Right. And they were all big movies with big cast, big box office grosses and all that. And they're, on t they're on television somewhere tonight. And that phase was, you know, really paved the way for everything that followed. And it was, it was a crazy time for us. And during all that, uh, you know, time when the books were selling like crazy, a Time to Kill came back, and all four of them were on the list. And so we, we realized, you know, obviously things had changed dramatically. And we, and we, we always said, look, uh, this is not going to last forever. Nothing lasts forever in popular culture, whether it's music, art, movies, even athletics. You know, nobody stays on top forever. At some point, the books are not going to be as popular as they are today. It may be something I do. It may be something that changes in the taste of the reading public, whatever. I don't know. Maybe the Kindle, the e-reader. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but when it's, when it's over, you know, I hope we have the sense to say, okay, uh, I hope I don't just keep cranking out books because of my name, and a lot of writers do that and a lot, sell a lot of books. We've always said, okay, you know, we're going to look back and say um, it was a hell of a ride, it was a lot of fun, but we didn't change. And we've raised our kids, you know, in a very, we, we work hard to, to have a normal life. Now, I do work hard at saying no. There are uh, probably... Well, there are a lot of requests every day for to go to bookstores, signings, events, you know, all over the all over the place. And uh, I told my publisher many years ago, look, I could hit the book circuit and go everywhere and be a celebrity, or I can go home and write the next book. Uh, what do you want me to do? And I didn't give him a chance to answer because I was going home. And uh, <laughs> home is what. Listen, when I'm home, it's a very uh, it's a very quiet life and. We work hard at keeping it that way. You have one assistant? I have one assistant, yeah, one full-time assistant, and that's, uh, that's plenty. I use a research assistant every now and then. I have great people in New York who keep a lot of stuff away from me. The floor is now open, so anybody who would like to ask John a question should get to the microphone, and I'll, John, I'll leave it to you to 
uh, okay. point to them. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, I, if you scream, I can. Use Hello? the microphone. Is this on? Yeah, you're good. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. Um, a lot of us do read the detail, not only in your narrative, but in your acknowledgments and wonder who some of these people are. <laughs> but we, I'm also very curious about the people you dedicate your books to. Can you tell us a little bit about who some of them are and how you decide who you're going to dedicate a book to? You know something? Um, that's the first time I've ever been asked that question. Congratulations. That's I mean. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think back. Uh, not all books are dedicated. Uh, one was dedicated to a friend who had uh, passed away while I was writing the book. Uh, one was dedicated to my favorite professor from law school who inspired me. Uh, that was the uh, appeal. Uh, the associate, I don't think, was uh, dedicated. The first couple of books were dedicated to my wife. Uh, my bleachers, my first football book was dedicated to my, my son, his high school football coach, and his high school teammates. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, if I would guess that half the book, oh, here's the That's the associate. Oh, I, I did dedicate that. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to Steve Rubin, Suzanne Hurst, John Pitts, Allison Rich, Rebecca Hall, and John Fontana and the rest of the gang at Doubleday. That's my, uh, those are my close friends who've been with me for a long time at Doubleday. And Steve Rubin is the publisher. And they give me, I have the luxury of knowing when I send the book off to New York, to these people, I have no worries. It's gonna be taken care of. Um, so I'm all over the place. And I think probably half of them have not been dedicated, but. Um, do, you, do you do the dedication after, I assume? Uh, the dedication can happen or not happen at any time. Uh, sometimes I know, I'll, you know, I know when I start the book, it's like a title. I have a horrible time with titles. Uh, I thought The Firm was just a working title. It was dull, flat, wasn't going to stick. I love that title now. Um, <laughs> and after The Firm, you know, I got into this habit of you know, the client, the partner, the, you know, that, that work, the chamber. And when something's working, you don't want to you don't want to mess it up. So uh, the associate, the appeal, uh, I'm going to stick with those very basic titles for a long time. But I don't have uh, I, I rarely have a title when I start. Uh, I think about it uh, through the writing process. There have been several times at the very last day I had to go to New York, go in the room, lock the door with those people I just mentioned and say, okay, what's the title? It gets to be that desperate. And, uh, you know, it all, always works out. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I read your book, The Painted House, and I have vivid memories of growing up listening to baseball. And I'm just curious, um, I was in St. Louis in 1968, and I'm sure you probably were attentive to, to the seventh game. But uh, just out of curiosity, who's the best right-handed pitcher that's ever pitched in the National <laughs> League? Hmm. Well, I'd have to say Bob Gibson because I'm a Cardinal fan. Yeah. That's a... Yes, ma'am. I read very little fiction except for you, and I'm mainly a nonfiction reader. Do you have any plans to write any more nonfiction after The Innocent Man? Any more nonfiction? Um, you never say never. I've learned that. Uh, when I finished The Innocent Man, I'll tell you how bad things were around the house. When I finished The Innocent Man, Renee hid the newspaper section with the obituaries. So. <laughs> she said, no more nonfiction. It took, um, it takes me six months to write a novel, uh, and that's with very light research. The Innocent Man, because it's a true story, because many of the people I wrote about were and are still alive and are not happy with the book. And a lot of them are lawyers, if you see where I'm going with this. Um, and I've already been sued three times because of that book, uh, which I sort of, I'm not surprised by. Uh, I, I had to work very, very hard to be accurate. And as Jonathan has reminded us, I'm not known for my accuracy. So uh, 
I don't know. I'm sure one of these days I'll see another story and take off again on another tear and get on the soapbox again and, you know, get mad. Yes. Hi. Um, I, I would like to say thanks for coming, too. I love your books. Um, you. My sister and I often discuss some of your books, and one time she said, um, do you suppose that he became a famous writer so that he could promote Christianity? And we have noticed that there is, and not in promote in the sense of, you know, shoving right. it down people's throat, but I, I noticed it again in The Associate that there's a character, and I'm very bad at remembering names, but a character who becomes a Christian, he was an alcoholic, and, um, and, and that's very well written, and um, it tells the story of a person who comes to know Christ. So I don't know if that is part of your purpose or if it just is part of your life and it comes out in your stories. I think it's part of my life as a Christian, uh, but you can't, again, you can't, um, when it comes to your religious beliefs in popular fiction, you better be very careful. I mean, you can't, you get a small little leeway to, to have one of your characters espouse maybe whatever you believe in because, um, you know, you're dealing with popular, if I want to write a book about faith, I'll write a book about faith. When you get to popular, popular culture, whether it's movies or books or music or whatever, um, you can do a little bit, but not much. Uh, but no, the purpose of the fiction is not to espouse my Christian beliefs. But there are some wonderful characters I've met along the way, like Brother Manny, the, 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 the character in that book, who uh, you know, went to prison and came out, later changed his life and became a, a wonderful character. Uh, I do that every now and then can't do it in every book. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi. I'd like to know what your inspiration was for skipping Christmas. Every year I dream of skipping Christmas. <laughs> um, it was about five or six years ago. Uh, I woke up the day after Christmas, and my job is always to clean up all this stuff in the house. And... Uh, I was doing that, and it was a bunch of junk that nobody needed, a bunch of food nobody wanted to eat, a bunch of bad wine nobody wanted to drink, you know, and it just stuff everywhere, just all this junk, you know, and I, was, I got in a foul mood. And as I was filling up the big black, you know, trash can bags, the mountain was getting bigger and bigger in the garage, and I finally just got mad. I went to my office, and I made a list of all the things you would have to skip if you could avoid Christmas. Start with the Christmas card, the Christmas fruit cake. I mean, it's a long list, okay? <laughs> and about six weeks later, the book was finished. <laughs> it was also, it was, uh, I, love, I love humor and comedy, okay? And in every one of these very serious legal thrillers, I'm going to throw in a couple of one-liners that I know there's no way they're going to survive, okay? Either Renee gets them or they get them in New York. They say, this is really funny, but you can't be funny right here, okay? Because people are, people are dying. So anyway. <laughs> so with Skipping Christmas, I had the golden opportunity to just try to be as funny as I possibly could. And thank you. Well, that's, that's, I thought it was a very funny book. I was very proud of it. Hi. I'm a professional person who for years read only books for my profession. But then I got hooked, and I want to thank you for uh, By the Firm, which was the first book I ever read for pleasure. And since then, I've been reading for pleasure co almost continuously. Uh, I also lived in Bologna, Italy, and I experienced very much what you wrote about in The Broker. It almost seemed like it was very real to me. So I was wondering about the research that you did do, did you live there in Bologna? Or how did you have this vast knowledge? Even the streets with you. Well, first of all, thank you. One of the nicest, uh, probably the nicest compliment that you can tell a writer is when you say, you know, I, I didn't read much until I, I, I was inspired by one or two of your books and now I enjoy reading. Or, or my, my teenage son or kid uh, wouldn't read and now won't stop. You know, that's, that's something very nice. So thank you for that. I didn't live in Bologna. Um, I would if I could get my wife over there. <laughs> it, it sounds like I spent a lot of time there, but I, I probably spent uh, probably less than a week, two trips. Uh, what I'll often do is I'll write the book and knowing there are soft spots and do the research later. 
And it, it's actually more efficient than researching everything and then having to go throw most of it out. So with Bologna, I wrote the scenes, you know, kind of soft. I had guidebooks and, you know, again, Google and all that. So when I went there, I had a checklist. You know, I got to see this place, this place, this place. And that makes the research, uh, it just goes a whole lot faster. But it's, I wanted to go, I love Italy, and I'd been to the all, you know, most of the other major cities. The broker could have been set anywhere in the world. Uh, but I wanted to try a different city in Italy I'd never been to. And, and again, that's, that's part of the, this research I have to do is go there and eat all that food and you see, <laughs> go to these beautiful. Are we done? Yes, We're out of time. I'm sorry. To call those, those Thank y'all. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.